Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel Wrightside Blonde. Today I'm going to bring you the April 1997 issue of George with the dog on the cover. And there really should have been more covers of George with dogs on the cover. That's just my only, that's my only complaint to John Kennedy is that there should have been more George covers with dogs on the cover dressed up. But I guess now everyone dresses their dogs up so maybe it's not as big of a deal. But this is the issue that says, Can America Be Saved? And I wanted to highlight the interview John Kennedy did with Norman Schwarzkopf because he mentions something that I find really interesting, and that is the role of the media in a war situation. So let's read. This article is called The Last Campaign. After his Gulf War triumph, this old soldier could have simply basked in the victory. But General Norman Schwarzkopf still has some fight left in him. John Kennedy talks to the American hero about sexism in the military, Gulf War syndrome, and new hope for sick kids. Don't hold your breath waiting for General H. Norman Schwarzkopf to throw his hat in the ring and run for office. It's too damn nasty, he says of public life. But as a spokesman for Nature Conservancy and for the recovery of the Grizzly Bear Project, a partner of Paul Newman's in a camp to aid sick children, and most recently a contributor to NBC reporting on local heroes, he might be too damn busy solving problems outside government. Best known for winning the most technologically advanced war in history, all in a mere 100 hours, Schwarzkopf says one of his most interesting new endeavors is the Starbright Foundation. Created through a unique partnership of healthcare providers, corporate powerhouses such as Intel Corp, Sprint, UB Networks, and World Inc., and master alchemist Steven Spielberg, Starbright has created a virtual reality play space that enables hospital children to communicate with one another in a voice-based fantasy medium. Still in its infancy, the project aims to expand beyond the seven hospitals now connected and to establish a link for hospitals and their young patients around the nation. The man leading the charge is none other than the general himself. All it took was a call from Spielberg, and Schwarzkopf signed on as chairman of the capital campaign with a mandate to raise $60 million. A decade ago, Norman Schwarzkopf was a well-respected but hardly well-known figure. In 1988, at the tail end of his career, he was assigned as head of U.S. Central Command, not generally considered a launching pad for a stratospheric military career. At the time, Pentagon planners were still preoccupied with the Soviet Union, and a NATO command was still the most prestigious. A war against Iraq was considered a remote possibility at best, but in August 1990, Iraqi tanks rolled across the Kuwaiti border, and Schwarzkopf was handed an opportunity that is bestowed upon a military man once in a generation. I met with the general at his home in Lutz, Florida, an idyllic gated community bounded on one side by the Arnold Palmer Golf Camp and on the other by the Nick Bollettieri Tennis Clinic. Judging from the photographs that adorn the walls of his home, it's clear that his outdoor interests veer more toward hunting and fishing than the country club variety. In the room where we talked, there was a pair of wooden, glass-paneled high boys brimming with mementos from his military days, swords from the Saudis, medals and sashes from the Kuwaitis, and, in an uncharacteristic display of gratitude, a white dress cap from the French Foreign Legion marking his designation as an honorary private first class, the only American in history to be so honored. For a man whose beloved military has lately come under piercing scrutiny on issues as varied as sexual harassment, hazing, and Gulf War syndrome, the 62-year-old general is remarkably frank. Perhaps the one thing he's most sure about is that he is more effective as an influential private citizen and problem solver than as a public official. So Colin Powell, take this general off your short list. He's marching to the beat of his own drummer. Not drum, drummer. Interesting choice of words. John Kennedy says, you presided over the most heavily press covered war in history. Media saturation is a trend that will only accelerate. How does it alter military thinking? The general says, the Vietnam War taught us that it's disastrous to wage a war when public opinion is very much against it. During the Persian Gulf War, television was hugely important, not only here but around the world, and it helped keep public opinion behind us. It's important to remember that in our news conferences, I was always aware that I was talking to four different audiences. First, I was addressing the citizens of the United States of America and the rest of the world. Second, there were the troops who heard what I had to say over the radio or television. Third, I was talking to my masters in Washington. And fourth, I was talking directly to my enemy. Every word I said went right to Saddam Hussein's headquarters via CNN. John Kennedy asks, 
During wartime, are the interests of the press and the military inevitably opposed? The general says, journalists will always be interested in getting the story, the byline, the scoop. And I'm interested in exactly the opposite. I want to ensure that a news story won't affect military operations or give away our plans or expose our troops' positions. The problem in Granada was that we didn't tell the press about the invasion ahead of time. We didn't allow the press on the island, so they tried to get there by speedboat three or four days after the invasion, but were intercepted by a Navy aircraft. When the reporters failed to turn back, the aircraft fired live rounds in front of the vessel. Only then did the journalists turn away from the island. At a press conference, Vice Admiral Metcalf, the commander of the mission, was asked what would have happened if the boat hadn't turned around. He replied that he would have blown it out of the water. That was not the right answer. John asks, what about leaking? It's an accepted part of politics, but can you get away with it in the military? The general said, there's no doubt in my mind that it probably goes on at lower levels, but it doesn't go on amongst the highest ranks. On a couple of occasions, I may have struck a deal with somebody, not to get favorable press, but to protect someone that I felt needed my help. I might call up a reporter and say, I know you want to interview this guy, but look, he's been beaten around the head and shoulders, so don't take him apart. One of my main concerns is how to handle the media in future wars. In Vietnam, we had 100 reporters. In the Gulf, we had 2,060. Who knows? In the next war, we may have 5,000. John asks, have you envisioned a situation where you might actively engage the media in an attempt to deceive the enemy? The general said, as a matter of fact, at the very early stages of the Gulf War, right after Iraq invaded Kuwait, the military deception planners at the Pentagon came up with various suggestions, including an idea that we plant false stories in the press. But the decision reached, and it was taken to the highest level, was no, you don't do that in a democracy. You don't deliberately lie to the press. John Kennedy asks, with the recent Gulf War syndrome controversy, there's a sense in the press that the Pentagon wasn't completely forthcoming regarding the release of toxic gases on the battlefield. Is that a byproduct of the manner in which the Pentagon managed information during Vietnam and Grenada of the chickens coming home to roost? The general said, part of the problem is that there's a section of the press and of the population more generally, that looks for conspiracies and cover-ups. One misstep is all it takes to convince them that the Pentagon covers up everything. Now, with Gulf War Syndrome, it wasn't the Pentagon's fault. The Department of Defense made the mistake of saying that no chemical weapons had been released during the war. Subsequently, they found out that chemical weapons had been stored at Chemesia, in a bunker that we bombed, and they had to retract their statement. They still weren't sure whether toxic gases had been released into the atmosphere. After that information, everybody said, you see, the Pentagon knew something and was covering it up. But during the war itself, not once did I receive a report saying that the Iraqis had used chemical weapons or that we'd blown up a chemical weapons dump, not once. John said, but you knew there was a possibility that American troops might be subjected to chemical weapons attacks during the Gulf War. The general said, that's right. If we had gone to war right away in August of 1990, we probably would have run into chemicals. Let's face it. Saddam Hussein used chemicals against the Iranians very effectively. Our plan was to take away Hussein's ability to deliver his chemical weapons. In the very early stages of the war, we attacked all of their chemical storage areas. We attacked their airfields. We knocked out every single piece of field artillery because we wanted to destroy all the different means that chemical weapons could be delivered. John Kennedy asks, what precautions were taken for the safety of American troops? And the general said, we had trained for years to fight the Warsaw Pact and they had much stronger chemical capabilities than the Iraqis. We did exercises using chemical overgarments and gas masks. We taught our troops how to administer the atropine injection, which would counteract the effects of nerve gas. John asked a few more questions and then said this, if it was discovered that chemical weapons had been released, it would be very hard for the Defense Department to admit it now. And the general said, that's Senator Jay Rockefeller's position. I would be a very popular guy if I stood up and said my troops were exposed to chemical weapons and that the Department of Defense covered all of this up. Man, people would build statues to me, but I can't say it because it's not true. John said, had you found chemical weapons, I imagine it would have added to the moral imperative behind the war effort. The general replied precisely. At one point before the ground war began, President Bush sent a communique to Saddam Hussein, which said that if he used chemical weapons, he should be prepared for us to use all the force we had available against him, and that included nuclear weapons. John Kennedy asks, the military action in Somalia is often regarded as television's war. Television got us in and television got us out. Do you agree? And the general responds, the answer is very simple. 
The television cameras were there long before the American troops arrived, and the American public was bombarded with pictures from Somalia. Therefore, we end up in Somalia. We could just as easily have gone to Ethiopia or the Sudan if altruism had anything to do with it, and we probably should have gone to the Sudan rather than anywhere else. John Kennedy then states, Some critics say television has made a paper tiger of our defense establishment, that this huge military machine is afraid to act because television could turn public opinion against it quickly. The general said, I don't think so. No decision I made as a field commander was influenced by the press. Of course, all casualties should be unacceptable. The job of a military command is to accomplish the mission with a minimum loss of human life. Before we set foot in Saudi Arabia, some prominent people were predicting 20,000 casualties. The miracle of the Gulf War was that we were able to accomplish so much with so few casualties on our side. John Kennedy asks a few more questions and then asks this one. It's unlikely that many future presidents will have served in the military. What implications will this have for the relationship between the military and political establishments? The general replies, it concerns me greatly. One of the reasons George Bush was such a good commander in chief was because he had served in the military and he clearly understood the roles of the president, the secretary of defense, the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, and the theater commander. He allowed everybody to do their job. And John said, is that what makes a good commander in chief? And the general replies, well, let me compare President Bush with Robert McNamara. McNamara selected bombing targets in North Vietnam from his office in the Pentagon. But as the Secretary of Defense, he wasn't qualified to do that. There were people who had 30 years of aerial bombing experience whose recommendations were overlooked. It's a common problem. You see people who are appointed Secretary of the Navy and all of a sudden believe they're Admiral Nimitz. They should listen to their military advisors. Sure, politicians should question and challenge the people who work for them, but a president or a politician who ignores our advice does so at his or her peril. They'd better be darn sure they have a good reason for doing so. John Kennedy goes on to ask a few more questions in this article, but the ones I highlighted are the ones that I wanted to bring up in this video. The most interesting topic that I found from this article was the role of the media in wartime, particularly the concept of broadcasting your next move through the media. I think a lot of people would like to know what happens, but if you think about it, why would we broadcast what we're going to do? Because, as General Schwarzkopf said, the enemy is listening too. He has four audiences, the American people, and the last one is the enemy. He knows he's speaking directly to them. Which begs the question, is that still going on? Are there still press conferences being had with certain people with a war that might be happening that we don't even know is happening, and communication is being sent to the enemy without us even knowing it? It's an interesting concept, one that I know a lot of you are thinking at this moment in history, and one to ponder. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. That does it for this episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided. I mean, actually, taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly, the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms. Uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that we felt that political magazines per se hadn't your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday that's what I hear would she have liked George I think she would have